thanks thanks for joining us and thanks for letting me know about the the volume uh, problem the audio problem uh, I'm really excited about this particular topic because I've learned the hard way that it's vitally important it's equally as important as the technical aspects of your program in fact it might even be more important and yet it's usually neglected so um, thrilled to have you join me today in fact this is the strongest turnout we've had for any of our webinars we have a hundred people that have registered um, as we go forward today you will be able to ask questions and uh, raise raise hands if you have any uh, if you want to be uh, say something I can unmute your line and a few of you are unmuted now uh, because of what we just went through but uh, feel free to let me know I am alone today my team is either overseas or at the association planning meeting series uh, and the standards activities so I'll do my best. If I don't get to answer your questions today, I'll send them back by email. And let's move forward to the next topic. I have a training workshop planned again for this summer. And in fact, this topic today, the QMS plan, will be covered in more depth. We'll spend two, two plus hours on it, <clears throat> and we'll include class exercises. We will give you scenarios to consider, <clears throat> discuss, and um, get into the details of it. So please join us. It's a great, a great opportunity. These are the topics that we'll be covering. And <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to just move right into it. A few acronyms. Uh, ESD Program Management, as many of you know, is the title of my book. And <clears throat> you'll notice I'm emphasizing the quality system because it is so important. And in the book, you'll find there are many chapters on that aspect of the program. Some acronyms that you're familiar with, I'm sure. The QMS benchmarking that we do is something we developed when, we, when Terry Welsher and I were managing the AT&T program. We had 67 sites, and Bell Laboratory designed support teams uh, for each of those sites that we oversaw and found this benchmarking to be an invaluable tool uh, uh, for the company as well as our supply chain. Uh, human body model, charge device model, charge board event, cable discharge event, and of course electrical overstress. And as you may know, um, ESD is a subset of electrical overstress. Now, um, I just got a question I noticed on the webinar. What we will do, uh, I'm recording it now, and we will post it on our website. You'll, it'll be there either later this week or next week. Good question. Thank you. OK, so there are two primary elements to the QMS plan. One of them is the technical aspects of it. Clearly uh, vitally important, and yet, um, and, and many companies do a good job uh, with this piece of it, although not all. And it's essential to have comprehensive requirements <clears throat> and procedures that include uh, the charge device model, human body, charge board event, cable discharge, and class zero. In many cases, you'll find you need a special operating procedure for class zero. And of course, uh, a sound qualification plan for the materials in your program. The other piece of it is the QMS plan, the implementation of a robust plan. And <clears throat> here is where it usually falls down. But you, to do this, you have to have a internal expertise. It's vitally important that you have that on hand to deal with issues as they come up. You also have to develop 
with the plan a means of consistently complying with the sound requirements. If you can't follow the procedures, you can't <clears throat> have an effective program. There is uh, a need for a very robust internal auditing strategy, and I'll elaborate on that uh, shortly. And then, of course, uh, consistent use of the qualified materials. Often we find variation where the materials have been properly qualified but are not consistently being used. Here is a list of uh, pertinent paragraph titles from the ISO 9001 quality system sets of requirements. Now, as you look down this list, think about how you might relate these topics to your ESD program. In fact, it's a good exercise to go back and read the associated paragraphs to get a sense of what is necessary and how to apply these concepts to your ESD program. And we're going to, we're going to now show you uh, a list that will cover these topics that are in ESD terms. OK, first of it, at the top of the list here is management commitment. You absolutely have to have a uh, high-level commitment, and it's appropriate to go for that early in the process. It uh, makes everything else much less complicated and is sometimes underestimated also. The next layer of the onion is planning, Put, you know, putting together a systemic plan that takes into account all of the issues that one uh, will run into. You know, get a group together and really give it some serious thought. And uh, here we have the next topic, which is the supply chain and the qualification of it. We'll talk a little more about that uh, in the upcoming slides. And I'll show you how the, the benchmarking ties into this. New product qualification critically important and you know in all the factories we've been to that category usually has the poorest score on the benchmark in fact most companies score zero on the new product introduction scenario mm -hmm. you have to have technical expertise and you have the requirements that you put together not only need to be technically sound but they also have to be realistic, realistic so that you can uh, strictly enforce them. A material qualification process we'll talk about a bit. Uh, training is essential, and advanced training for the program manager, auditor training and certification, and uh, recurrent training. Mm. And then, of course, you have uh, the internal QMS auditing strategy. Now, this may be new to many of you, and I'm going to, as a result, I'm going to elaborate on that. Uh, this is uh, what I found to be the secret sauce. Keep in mind the size of the company that Terry and I led, and the facility where I was resident, we had 12,000 employees and had to find a way to get full compliance. And we did it. And, and this topic, again, is the secret sauce. Advanced test equipment, especially for today's technology. A communication plan. This is so often underestimated. Uh, I'll give you an example. I had a, a woman that I knew in the factory, a uh, really nice person, and she knew me really well. And she approached me and she said, uh, Ted, when are you going to make up your mind? And uh, I said, okay, tell me what you mean. <laughs> and she, she told me that a particular requirement had changed three times in the last six months, and it was driving her crazy. And I said, well, tell me what they were. And so she told me all three scenarios. And I said, believe it or not, all three are incorrect. And I showed her the written requirements, which was yet a fourth version. So uh, what it comes back to is, 
if you send out information once and expect it's going to be received, you're kidding yourself. Uh, really place some emphasis on that topic. And of course, continuous improvement. That goes without saying. You have to continuously look for better ways to resolve the uh, situations that arise. OK, let's talk a little more about the supply chain qualification. First of all, uh, does, is, is 2020 sufficient? You know, does, uh, does it cover all the requirements that are necessary for your products? For instance, if you have extreme sensitivities, such as class zero, 2020 only partially covers that. And the same is true for charge device, charge board, cable discharge, and of course, best practices. So uh, keep in mind uh, that 2020, as good as it is, and it is the best, does not fully cover critically important topics. And chances are your supply chain is going strictly by 2020. Now, is your supplier's QMS system adequate? Does their checklist include these technically important topics? Usually not. Usually they go by uh, what uh, S2020 and TR53 specify. Now, how about the OEMs and their assessments of suppliers? Is that strategy effective? Typically, uh, when you look at the audit checklist, it's a rare occasion that we find I can't think of one where an OEM's uh, supplier auditing checklist was adequate. Uh, likewise, there's a question about the teams that do the audits of the supply chain. Are they well equipped to evaluate the efficacy of the QMS system or the technical requirements? Usually the answer is no. There are exceptions. Very important considerations here. Now, uh, continuing on, the key thing that connects with today's discussion is that the quality system governs the outcome of the process. And therefore, you, it, it is prudent to assess the quality system. There's a tendency to dig into specific technical requirements, which is important. I don't want to uh, diminish that, but it's equally as important to evaluate their quality system. If they have a robust quality system, they will have a good ESD process. And again, to emphasize, we have found this benchmarking approach to be the most effective strategy. And it is really a beginning. You do the benchmarking, um, the data will correlate to the yields, and it allows tracking and metrics by which you can uh, quantify your supplier's effectiveness. It is then followed by on-site verification. But the beauty of this is that the benchmarking data tells you which sites need the site visit and which ones are doing well. As an example, we can interview a company on the phone and in the course of approximately an hour uh, tell you with 90% confidence how good their, their program is and whether uh, deeper evaluations are necessary, such as an on-site assessment. Now, let's um, move on here. This is an example of the output from the benchmarking that I have in mind. And each bar represents a manufacturing site and their score on this QMS performance indication. And you can see that uh, we have colored the contract manufacturing uh, in a general way here for tier one and tier two CMs. And typically they are in this lower right region. Um, those that have worked with us for a year or more or less sometimes uh, often get up into the preferred status. Now, why are they in this region? Well, it's because uh, best practices go beyond 2020. So if you're fully compliant with 2020, you would score in this region here between uh, 
50 and 70 uh, percent compliance. So it's reasonable to expect the CMs to be in this lower right category. The other thing we've found is that from year to year, their scores vary. You know, one year they'll be up here at the higher end of the continuum, and uh, a following year they might drop down here because of personnel changes. And if you're down below this red line, you're in the high risk zone. What we see there are companies that can operate successfully for years, and then uh, the variables align in a worst case scenario, creating um, a major excursion in high failure rates or worse, reliability failures. But again, the beauty of this benchmarking is that it gives you the ability to track and monitor and anticipate and, and generally prevent these kinds of issues. Here is objective evidence of what I've just said. We have, uh, this is a company that happened to be in China, and each data point on this chart represents um, ESD damage in the manufacturing line. They had the, their luxury of being able to determine that as the product flowed through the line. And you can see with a good 2020 program in place, they still had losses as high as 22%. Very serious problem. Uh, we did an advanced assessment, uh, some uh, you know four days of training, and look at what happened to their yields. They started to implement the benchmarking and best practices and CDM requirements. And you can see that their yields improved sharply and stayed at that level, eventually approaching 100%. And their scores on the benchmarking tracked the yields as we have consistently seen over the years. OK, uh, what do we mean by operational planning and control excellence? Well. As I said earlier, this is frequently underestimated, and it will literally make or break your program. I, I tried so many different ways of doing this and eventually found uh, the, the path and the way that works. And we were able to get uh, nearly perfect compliance throughout the building and company. So it requires a total system approach where you look at all the pieces, in fact, I'll bring up the next bullet. Uh, each part is part of an integrated whole. If you make a change in one area, it has a ripple effect elsewhere. And it, uh, needs, to, it needs to be done such that uh, human error is improbable. In other words, engineer the process such that the most convenient way to do what you want them to do uh, is the way they're going to want to do it. And you have to verify process quality. Many companies rely just on TR-53, which is the uh, auditing instruction associated with 2020. We have found if you go one step further and add this QMS sampling plan, uh, that is what brings all the pieces together and, again, is the secret sauce here. communication plan we mentioned earlier, and naturally continuous improvement. And the way you do that is through root cause analysis. You, if you have a good auditing system with appropriate metrics, you know, tracking metrics, you can use that information to uh, manage the process, and we'll elaborate momentarily. And then, of course, uh, corrective actions. Now, material qualification. Develop a robust qualification process, and you have to go beyond supplier data sheets. In fact, you often have to go beyond industry standard test methods by creating application-appropriate tests. For instance, uh, if you have flight hardware outgassing from an ESD mat and contamination from the outgassing could be devastating. And that outgassing is not in any of the ESD association standard tests. So that's an example of what I mean. You, you really have to look at this from an engineering perspective. 
So the next bullet uh, ties in nicely. What we're saying is this is an engineering responsibility, not necessarily a technician. You may there may be exceptions, of course, but certainly engineering has to be involved deeply and direct. You could direct uh, technicians to do the work, but engineering really needs to step back and say, you know, well, how are we going to use this? What variables are critical? What variables are not covered by ESDA standards that we need to apply? And then, of course, retain the information so that you have it for posterity and any subsequent uh, certification audits. Then naturally uh, fully qualify all of the control elements, taking into account charge device as well as charge board event, cable discharge, etc. And select the best of the best for each category and standardize on that best of the best. You'll find that the especially if you have a large operation like, like uh, Terry and I had to deal with, if you have a wide variety of materials and you find there's a problem uh, of some nature, it becomes very difficult to translate that to all of the other uh, variations of products that you may have selected. So go with uh, best of the best and follow the, the, that quality uh, planning. And then uh, once you have developed and selected your list, formally document it. Make it a required list. Make it mandatory in part of your internal auditing. If uh, somebody uses, a, say, a tabled mat that's not on the approved list, that should be a finding. And you'll find by doing that that they'll all move in the direction you want them to go. Then uh, one of the toughest places to solve, or the problems to solve, is getting purchasing to comply. Um, that, was, that was a major hurdle. You've, you've got to work out a strategy that is compatible with your existing purchasing plan. Especially today, there's, it's easy for individuals uh, within the company to use a credit card to go out and buy something. So give that some thought and figure out a way to make it happen. Uh, it also connects with what I said a minute ago. If somebody b selects a material that is not in the approved materials list, it should show up in audit findings. Design transfer oversight. This is, I, again, remember I mentioned in the beginning that new product introduction on the benchmarking that we do, most companies score very poorly in this category. Often they score zero. They just haven't given it appropriate thought. Uh, here is one example. This was a, a device that was sent into our manufacturing line with no prior knowledge. We had no idea that it was a 10 volt or 10 to 15 volt sensitive device. And as a result, we ended up with 100% failure rates in many instances during ramp up of a $1 billion product line. It's a little difficult to meet. Uh, customer demands and shipping commitments when you have this kind of a failure rate. Terry and I were meeting with uh, the vice presidents of AT&T way too often. So uh, a word to the wise, find out what the sensitivity is of the devices before they go into manufacturing. And here you can see just in this one component alone, we we documented uh, savings of over $6 million per year. Here was a, a problem of even greater proportions. This is a typical transmission, you know, telecommunications transmission uh, system. You can see it's enormous. And looking at it, you'd say, this cannot be ESD sensitive. Well, we were surprised. We found out the hard way that the design team had not done the system level stress testing specified by this IEC specification. And it turned out to be a very expensive ESD event detector. In fact, each bay here was a quarter of a million dollars. So you see down here, you've got you know, well over a million dollars in equipment. And it uh, would go into major alarm uh, 
due to ESD discharges from coins in pockets in people up to 15 feet away from the system. Incredibly sensitive. In fact, one of the more embarrassing moments in my career, uh, we plugged a wrist strap into a competitor's bay adjacent to one of ours. The customer's bay worked fine. Ours went into major alarm, even though we plugged into the neighboring customer bay. The impact was enormous. This kind of a problem has incredibly high visibility. Executives get involved. And in this instance, we documented uh, a loss in revenue of $1 billion due to this uh, design oversight. So what do we do about it? Well, you, most of you, I expect all of you uh, associated with manufacturing have a manufacturing acceptance process or a review process or new product introduction. This is the time to verify that things are being done correctly by your design team. So add a requirement in the factory checklist to verify that device withstand voltages are available for all new products. I'm not talking about those in production already, but new ones. Make sure you require getting HBM and CDM data, require getting uh, test results from this IEC test so you can avoid the two examples that I just gave you. Now, uh, what you can do also is to you know, collaborate with your design team, find out what requirements they specify, and then in the factory review, verify the data with the uh, design requirements. And also have your ESD program manager in the approval process. Make sure that uh, he or she is there to verify this uh, cross-check is being done correctly. Now, if you have devices outside the scope of S2020, and uh, for those who may not know, that would mean class zero devices with HBM sensitivities below 100 volts or CDM sensitivities below 200 volts, that should trigger a uh, a, a manufacturing risk and manufacturing and design risk assessment. You know, high, high, how high is the risk that we're taking? Uh, is our manufacturing capability adequate for those levels of sensitivity? Do we have to add additional requirements? And uh, ideally, go back to the design team to see if they could replace uh, the devices or have the devices redesigned to be more robust. And then, of course, you'll have to, once you have devices outside the scope of 2020, you'll need appropriate customized requirements to uh, achieve successful uh, ESD production. And, of course, this goes back to what I said earlier. You need a subject matter expert to accomplish these things. Okay, so now let's go on to the next slide. Realistic and technically sound requirements. Uh, again, I want to emphasize the realistic nature of it. The requirements have to be realistic, otherwise you will not be able to strictly enforce them. And if you can't strictly enforce them, you lose control of the program. These are the association documents. Um, they're excellent, and they work for many, many applications. Um, here you have S2020, which uh, is the fundamental set of requirements. TR-53 is the compliance verification guidelines. And then, of course, the handbook has additional uh, supporting technical information. All very, very useful and, again, work for many applications. But as you get into uh, extreme sensitivities, advanced technologies, we found the need to go well beyond that and have written requirements to do so. They're quite detailed. Each document is about 50 pages, um, although the requirements section is only about 10 or 12 pages, <coughs> but proved to be essentially uh, essential and necessary. Uh, this uh, chart we showed you earlier, and it 
it's applying those added requirements uh, in those documents I just showed you that allowed this level of improvement. So what we're saying is 2020 is a great foundation. In many instances, you have to go beyond that. OK, internal uh, auditing or QMS strategy. This is uh, this element here, as I said earlier, is a, the secret sauce. And I'm going to give you a, you know, a brief overview of it. This piece of it, by the way, is um, you know, TR, S2020 tells you you need to put together a compliance verification plan. The strategy and the details of it are user defined. And this that we're going through now is uh, one way of looking at it that we have found to be a very, very effective. I also get very enthusiastic about this topic because I have found that the internal QMS strategy is really the binding force that brings the program together. It's an essential tool that will foster compliance. And if you do it in a constructive way, it will trigger self-initiated corrective action. Uh, literally, before implementing this, uh, I felt like I was out there pleading with people to do the right thing. After implementing this strategy, it turned the tables around 180 degrees. People came to me asking, "How do we, how do we uh, fix these things? How do what, you know? What's the what do I need to do to uh, correct the data that's coming out of this?" auditing strategy. It will strengthen your management commitment naturally. And um, it will literally uh, make or break the program. Now, it turns out, to, to my way of thinking, there are five levels that need to be factored in. One is a uh, annual third party assessment, where you bring in a fresh set of eyes from the outside to evaluate what's going on and to include the benchmarking. And of course, employee self-checks. That's uh, standard protocol, testing wrist straps, footwear is certainly a key part of it. And others have uh, extended checklists for individuals. 2020 specifies TR53 compliance verification and 100% testing of the items in that document. A uh, very good foundation to build from and appropriate. But it's not enough. What we have found is that this QMS sampling strategy uh, will get you to a much better place. And it becomes increasingly important with the more sensitive applic devices. What you're really doing here is verification of process quality. Another way of putting it is TR53 and testing the various elements of the program is supposed to uh, introduce the quality controls that are necessary and the employee self-checks. Um, this item number four is to verify that those other safeguards are actually working. So it will include all of the other items. Uh, the TR53 verification of materials. I mentioned earlier, are you using qualified materials or not? That needs to be in your QMS sampling plan, as well as procedures. Uh, certain elements of the administration need to be verified. And typically, it works best as a, a re responsibility of the quality department. Now. If you have extreme sensitivities outside the scope of 2020, you may also need a, a, a basic SPC program. I'll give you an example. We had one case where high failure rates were problematic, and ionization and a whole bunch of other techniques were not successful reducing the failure rates. So what we had the client do is ground the product to an ESD mat immediately prior to doing the test. We knew that the failures were happening at this particular test. 
and we found that a momentary contact with that mat was inadequate. They had to uh, hold it against the mat for four seconds to remove all of the charge to prevent damage. So that's a good example of where an additional SPC uh, protocol would be appropriate. Okay, let's get into it a little further. What, there's a quality metric um, necessity. You have to be able to measure your 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 program. If you if you can't measure your program and quantify the effectiveness of it, you don't have a program. So uh, let's get into a little further to explain uh, what I'm talk, talking about. Okay, number one, what we're talking about is verification of process quality. Are all the elements of the program working? Uh, let me give you another example. Suppose you found uh, a high percentage of wrist straps were actually defective. That would tell us that there's a problem with the, pro the quality process as it is. Where is it? Is it the, the effective material? Is it the test equipment? Is it the way that people are doing the testing? So you have to get into it in that level of detail. Now, to do this, are we talking about a sample or a full inspection? Picture that building I had with 12,000 people. Uh, to do this kind of a, an evaluation, it would be impossible to do a full inspection in a reasonable period of time. We found it was necessary to do this once a month, this, this QMS sampling. So it had to be a sampling plan. You're looking at attributes. Is it right or wrong? It's not variables data. Are they wearing the wrist strap or not? Is it the right material or not? So now, how do you do this for a huge uh, facility or even a small one? Do you need many uh, inspectors or not? As an example, for 12,000 people, how many auditors do you suppose I needed? Well, because of the sampling strategy, we were able to do this once a month for 12,000 people with one person, which is highly cost effective. And again, this, this is the secret sauce. You have one person doing it, one consistent interpretation of what they see. Therefore, the internal benchmarking is valid one area to the next. Now, that means the inspector has to be the perfect inspector. And that's not always easy. So you have to really spend time uh, choosing the right person, somebody who's highly observant. I had a, a, a woman who wanted this job, and she was fabulous, really, really great personality, uh, really eager. But she was not observant. She would a trip over a broken ground wire and not see it, <laughs> not to report it. So uh, I had to give it to somebody else. OK, so now that you, if you have a good sampling strategy and, the, and reliable metrics that you can internally benchmark, you can now use the data to effectively manage the program and leverage limited resources. We all have limited resources. You, you, so uh, how do you take advantage of what you have and get the most out of it? Well, here's an example. You, you go through this. Uh, this is actual data for uh, the 12,000 people. And in this particular cycle, we found a very high failure rate on wrist straps. In fact, it persisted for some time. Uh, we tried to get the supplier to fix the there was a mechanical problem, design flaw in the wrist strap, and uh, they were uh, they couldn't fix it. So we had to change suppliers. And uh, let me before I move on to the next slide, think about the the format of what I'm showing you. When you see it in this Pareto format, it's obvious that wrist straps is the problem to attack. So this is an illustration of what I meant earlier about taking um, advantage of limited resources. So, you know, these all are important down here, yes, but focus on the biggest one. Fix the wrist strap problem. And in this case, it required 
uh, as I say, changing suppliers. And uh, a month later, after having done that, you can see that the wrist strap problem had really diminished sharply. So now what's the next step? <coughs> it's, excuse me. The next step is to look at the next biggest problem, bench tops. It was now up uh, in the 35% range of the total findings. And uh, in this case, I found that the standard uh, QMS metrics did not have enough information. So I added some additional uh, data points for the auditor to gather. With that information, we found the root cause of these failures. It was hardware related, and um, we were able to redesign the hardware to such that they would not break going forward. And you can see now the wrist straps are even better off, and the table mats or benches are down here in the noise. So again, this is classic quality uh, tracking metrics and uh, root cause analysis. But doing it systematically with this Pareto format enables it to be much more effective. Here is an example of internal benchmarking uh, opportunities. Again, we have limited training resources. This, this uh, data shows uh, the various departments in the building. And you can see that some over here on the right are doing an excellent job. Some on the left are having high failure rates in the QMS sampling. So if you're the training manager, which groups do you train? You train this group over here that's almost perfect or over here? Another illustration of how to leverage uh, limited resources. The bottom line is that even though I, you know, at this point, at, at, at this point in time, right at the starting of this chart, I thought we had a good program, and yet uh, we didn't. It was more window dressing than good. In fact, I went to 10 workstations and tested uh, a number of, you know, the critical elements in there and found that uh, we had, you know, I took 10 workstations, and I found that there were four broken ground wires, and there were, I don't know, five defective wrist straps, and the list went on and on. So what we had, as I said a minute ago, was window dressing. It really wasn't a great uh, program, even though it looked it. I didn't even go back to my office. I went to the vice president's office and said, I, I want to re-engineer this compliance verification, and uh, requested a full-time auditor. And that person was at my desk the next morning. And together, we created this QMS auditing strategy. Uh, and as I referred to it earlier, it became the secret sauce. So we were able to get 12,000 people down here. In, you know, down When you're down at this level of improvement, uh, it's really way down in the noise. And uh, I'll give you an example. We had, as a trial, we had 2020 uh, auditors come in when it first came out to do a 2020 assessment of our facility, knowing full well that we had really good program. Um, at the end of three days of questioning the troublemakers, the engineers, the managers, test set operators, they had two minor nonconformances, which I knew were there, and left them there to see if they'd find them. And they did, so I was pleased. Anyway, I, uh, it was a pre-assessment, and they said that um, it was excellent results, and I said, well, is it too late to change this to a certification assessment? And they said, yeah, as you, they laughed at me, and I said, yeah, as you know, you, you can't do that. Um, and I said, well, is it too late to change my mind? And they said, well, yeah, it is. We, we, you, you just can't change it. So I said, what are you doing Monday? You can come back and do it again. And the lead auditor left, called headquarters, came back in and he said, we've never done this before, we'll never do it again, you're certified. We could come back every Monday and we still wouldn't find anything. I'm saying this, this I'm giving you this story because it illustrates the value of this secret sauce. I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of this sampling strategy to verify the quality of your process. 
And we had corresponding yield improvements and major uh, savings, dollar savings <coughs> across the board, really enormously effective. Now, um, there's a quality adage that if you want things to improve, measure the results. If you want them to improve rapidly, report the results. And I can tell you from firsthand experience how you report the results makes all the difference. You need to make the, the data readily available to the executives, the managers, the engineers, the people that drive, that ultimately drive the quality system. It will foster uh, continuous improvement and, uh, as I said earlier, <coughs> excuse me, trigger self-initiated corrective actions. And I'll show you why in a minute. Uh, issue the individual reports back to the line managers within 24 hours. Get the information right back to them and, um, if necessary, discuss uh, corrective actions. Usually what happens when these reports are delivered, they ask for help if they're in trouble. And then uh, publish it further. Publish it, publish it to a larger group during uh, business results meetings when the vice presidents are there and upper management. Again, make, make the results visible so that it will support your initiative. And here is one format, one that we found very effective. Here is, uh, this, this area here is the trend data for the entire factory. And we had set a, a, an objective of a, a goal of having less than one finding per department. And in some of the inspection cycles, we, that we accomplished that. But keep in mind, we're way down in the, you know, we're, we're over 90% down below the original uh, level. In fact, let me, now I'll, I'll come back. Let, let me just move on. Um, what I've done here with this format, you ha what I've is done is to identify uh, the worst performing departments. So these departments here, one through four, represented uh, 30 percent, you know, it represented a high percentage of the uh, findings, almost 30 percent of the findings overall. And <clears throat> I put the name of the manager on these charts for each of these departments. Managers did not want to be on this list because they knew that their vice presidents were going to be seeing it. So this triggered, you know, you know motivation uh, at, at the highest level to get uh, off this list and correct the problems. So as I said earlier, what happens now when you report it this way is it turns the tables. Instead of you being out there pleading for people to do the right thing, you have managers and executives calling you to say, how do I fix it? How do, how do I improve the performance of the, the group and the team that they lead? Very, very effective in, in doing this. Now, a final uh, section here is related to test equipment. And I'm going to just show you a few, uh, some of the options that are out there. We tried to include options from different companies, but uh, especially as you go forward into the more sensitive applications, uh, class zero or charge device, charge board event and cable discharge, you're going to need some of these instruments. Uh, this electrostatic voltmeter here and here and here, uh, these three are the industry's best kept secrets. There's some really strong advantages to these instruments. Here, in fact, there are uh, videos on our website if you want to go and get a better understanding of that. They're complimentary and sh about five minutes each. And then um, you will want to take advantage of a contact voltmeter where you can, with these you know, needle pinpoint instruments, you can contact one pin on a device and determine what uh, potential is there. These are designed for contact with conductors, not um, uh, insulators. And then you have a wide range of resistance meters and probes that go with them. And of course, event detectors. This is 
these are equally as important as they are confounding. We often go to customer sites that have event detectors. They went in the factory and found that it was just it was running, it was just responding to background noise, and uh, as a result, stopped using them. So I, I empathize with that, but it is important to develop an understanding of how they work, how to overcome the interference from background noise. And once you've done that, it is a powerful tool to pinpoint the source of damage or uh, processes that need improvement. Uh, for those who may not know, the way these work is uh, when an ESD discharge occurs, it radiates an RF transient that can be detected <clears throat> with these portable event detectors or an oscilloscope set up properly. And um, by the way, Terry Walsher and his team did a great deal of the pioneering on event detection uh, when we were together at, at Bell Laboratories. So it's, it's uh, if you don't know how to use them, find out how to do it. And uh, that's one of the topics that we cover uh, in some detail in our July training session, one of the many topics. Now, uh, there is a relatively new uh, piece of test equipment available. <clears throat> what you're looking at here, this, this black object right here, is an ESD simulator. By, uh, uh, and what, what you do is it, it, you connect this item to a power supply and set the power supply to some designated voltage that you might want to evaluate. <clears throat> and by pressing this white button down in this chamber, it will uh, create an instantaneous metal-to-metal -metal discharge of that voltage that was set by the power supply. And it will trigger a radiated uh, ESD transient, which you can monitor with an oscilloscope. The beauty of this is that it's a small instrument. So if you're working with automation equipment, as an example, you can um, actually calibrate event detectors to respond to specific voltage levels. Um, if you say you're concerned about, you want to know that there are no event discharges at maybe, uh, I'll pick a number, say 500 volts or higher, you could put this uh, instrument into the automation equipment where you're concerned, trigger a 500 volt event, and calibrate it to an event detector to uh, know that when the equipment is running, it will report events over that level. Really nice, slick tool. It's also excellent for calibrating event detectors. Now I'll go back one slide. This, this event detector here is from uh, Simcoe Ion and it is uh, one that can be adjusted. The sensitivity can be adjusted. There are others that you can do that with as well, but uh, this one is particularly uh, effective. Now, um, this brings us to the end and a reminder that uh, a lot of the things we've talked about today will be discussed in much greater depth in July and love to have you here. We, uh, have a, we, we work, we play hard too. We take you to lunch at the yacht club for uh, to the yacht club for lunch, a boat ride back to the classroom, and later on in the week, a uh, lobster dinner at the uh, edge of Ipswich Bay. Anyway, I'd love to have you join us uh, if you can, and I appreciate you being uh, with me today, and <clears throat> would love to hear from you if you have any questions or concerns. Feel free to email or write to us, uh, call me, whatever uh, works for you, we'd be glad to, to help. And that's it for today. Thank you to everybody, and uh, good luck with your QMS system.